Right. So, um, single core 1971, dual core 2005, and it's just kept growing from there. So, um, by the middle of last year, um, Intel had a 28 core chip and AMD had a 32 core chip, and it's continuing to grow, and it's reasonable to assume that it will continue beyond that as well. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, the chip manufacturers are very cagey about not publicly releasing those kinds of details because it's a bad idea legally for them to be held to a public statement about what's going to happen in the future. So they will um, carefully speak in generalities and not get into too many details until a product is publicly released. So, um, if I did know what the answer was about what's coming next, I couldn't tell you because it would be under a non-disclosure agreement, but it happens that I haven't had a non-disclosure agreement in a while, uh, so I don't actually even know. All right, so having said all that, there we go. That is a kind of a famous graph. This was created, gosh, it's, it's um, I think more than 15 years ago now. Uh, this guy, Patrick Gelsinger from Intel, I don't even know whether he is still at Intel, he may have gone to some other company or whatever, it's a long time ago, he came out with this, and I mentioned something about this last time. Um, so, as clock speed goes up, so too does heat. And this kind of gives you, I, I was a little bit wrong, um, the current step is not um, hair dryer, it's hot plate, which is, you know, hot enough to boil water on. Um, so, a few hundred degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but then I was worried about, you know, we're coming up on a nuclear reactor. Um, rocket module is up here, and then we'll eventually get to the sun. Um, so you can't keep increasing the clock speed. That's why we went to multi-core. Because as the clock speed goes up, the heat goes up. As the heat goes up, your liability for burning down the building you're in goes up. Nobody wants that. Not on their laptop. Uh, so here's a nice quote from the person who made this graph. No one wants to carry a nuclear reactor in their laptop onto an airplane, which is good advice. Do not go on an airplane carrying a nuclear reactor. Even if it's a small one, just not a good idea. OK, so we talked about the registers last time, so I'm going to skip over all that. And we were on cache, and we were into RAM. Um, and we were talking about, well, I think we got through this. Yes, and we were now talking about cache hits and cache misses. So cache hit, that means that the data you want are already in cache. Of course, we talked about how in current chips, you don't just have cache, you have multiple levels of cache. You have L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache, some chips even have L4 cache before you actually get to the RAM. So all of those caches live in between the registers where things live when they're actually being used right now and the RAM. Um, and so cache hit, um, what's hidden in that is cache, depending on which level you're talking about, because you could certainly have a particular piece of data that's in L3 cache, level three, but is not yet in L1, because there isn't room enough for it. I was having a conversation with a colleague just last week about a particular piece of code that they're running, um, and it turned out that the particular thing that they're trying to do happens to fit into L1 cache. Not from anything clever they did, it just happens to fit in L1 cache. So what a surprise, they're getting very good performance. If, however, that thing were 50% bigger, or in this case, actually about 10% bigger, um, then it would not fit in cache, and then they'd be constantly, well, it wouldn't fit in L1, then they'd be constantly drawing it in from L2, okay? So cache miss is you go to find it and it's not there. Okay? So that's not terribly surprising. So if your data are small enough to fit in cache, you're really happy. And if your data are not small enough to fit in cache, you're very miserable. And we're going to get into some detail about what that really means. Okay. Now, let me add some weirdness to this because it turns out that all of this is incredibly weird. So if I want to use a particular single byte, let's say I just want one little byte from memory, what I can't do is I can't go out to memory and say, give me that one byte and only get that one byte drawn into cache. It doesn't work that way. What happens instead, and for now this will seem super weird, but in a bit 
will discover why it is this way. What actually happens when you say, give me that bite in memory, I want to bring it into such and so register, what actually happens is it goes out and it finds a whole bunch of bytes that include that bite. Um, so on the um, x86 chips today, if you say, give me address 1234, you get 64 bytes that include address 1234. How many of you think that sounds really good? How many of you think that's brilliant? Reserving judgment. Okay. Um, so good general principle, are the people who design chips idiots or geniuses? They're geniuses. Yes, they are indeed. So therefore, we can assume there's a really good reason, and we'll get to that reason hopefully today during our hours. I don't think we can do a part three on this, and we will tolerate that. Okay, so um, on the x86 chips today, all of the levels of cache use a 64-byte, what they call a cache line, which is the amount of stuff that's going to get drawn in from RAM into cache, no matter how many bytes you ask for. The minimum you're going to get is this. On um, the power family of chips, at least a couple of generations ago, yes, question? It's not a matter of walking away from the laptop, it's looking at the slides. Every time I look at the slides, I'm facing the other way. I can't not look at the slides, so. We're stuck with that. I'll do. I'll yell as loud as I can, but that's the best I can do. Okay, so on the power chips, 128 bytes. But these are somewhat arbitrary choices. It's, there's no perfect answer to how big should a cash line be. There's a famous joke that Abraham Lincoln used to say, uh, how long should a person's legs be? Long enough to reach the ground. So how big should a cash line be? Big enough to get the job done. But what's the definition of that? Eh, well, you know, even these two companies can't agree on what it is, so. Okay. So how this works is, and I think I've already sort of said this, when, I, when a program requests data from a particular location in RAM, the first thing that happens is check to see whether it's in cache. Now, does it only do one of those checks? Or does it do multiple? Got to do multiple. Is it in L1? Is it in L2? Is it in L3? Then if it fails all of those tests, then we go look and see if it's in RAM. Well, it'll be in RAM, right? You're asking for a particular memory location. Okay, so um, go see where it is. Right? If it's not in cache, if it is in cache, hey, I can get it from cache, and that'll be quick. But if it's not in cache, then I have to go all the way back out to RAM and we remember RAM is much, much, much slower than any of the caches. All the way up to RAM to go get it. And again, we don't get that byte. Or if you're asking for like a real number, a, a single precision number, that'd be four bytes. If it's double precision, that'd be eight bytes. It's not going to get those four bytes or eight bytes. Or if you ask for a character, that's one byte. It's not going to get that. It's going to get, in the case of x86, it's going to get 64 bytes. In the case of uh, power, it's going to get 128. This varies by chip size. Okay. And that means that in the meantime, your program is going to stall. It's going to stop while it waits for the data that it needs. Is that good or bad? Why is that bad? Because what? Say it again. It makes, it, it makes it slow, yes. And time is? Time is money. Exactly correct. Good. So we don't like cache stalls. We don't like cache misses because they cause a stall. And we don't want to stall. We want to keep doing stuff. We want to keep getting work done. OK? All right. Now, important. It may or may not be in cache, but it is in RAM. If it's not in cache, it is in RAM. If it is in cache, it's also in RAM. Okay. Now, this makes things a little bit complicated because what if you change the value that's in cache? Does that change the value that's in RAM? How many of you vote yes? How many of you vote no? How many of you vote it depends? Okay, so we'll come back to that, but the short answer is it depends, and generally what it depends on is which chip you bought. 
uh, because usually this is something that the decision that's hardwired into that chip. Now, um, there are three kinds of cache, um, and we're going to walk through them. It turns out in real life nowadays, only one of them actually gets used. But the other two are worth knowing about because the one that actually gets used sits between the two that don't get used. Okay. I do have an example of an older chip that uses one of the ones that no longer gets used. But nowadays, I'm not aware of any chip that uses two of these three. Only one of them is popular. Okay. So direct map cache, which today, as far as I can tell, no chip uses, but there used to be chips that used it. Direct map cache means for every location in memory, there's only one place that it can go to if it's drawn into cache. So if the program says, I need such and so address, then that address can only go into one place in cache. So if I've got 12 gig of RAM, like I have on my laptop, and I've got three meg of L3 cache, like I have on my laptop, then any byte in that 12 gig of RAM can only go to one place in the cache. Now, again, all blessings are mixed. So the advantage of direct map cache is that it's really cheap to make the change at least that part of the chip. Because you can think of this, this is not literally how it's implemented, but you can think of it as from every location in RAM, there's just one wire that goes to one place in cache. Again, that's not literally how it works, but we can think of it that way. And the pricing is sort of related to that. Now, so Power 4, which was a uh, early 2000s technology, about 2001, I think, was when Power 4 came out, give or take. We actually had a system like that on campus. Um, don't have that anymore, because that was many years ago. Um, it actually had its level one instruction cache was direct map. Um, that's pretty much, as far, I'm not aware of any chip today in 2018 that uses direct map cache. But back then, there, there were examples of that. So here's kind of a picture of that. So here's an address I've expressed it in binary. So some sequence of bits represents that address. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the first eight bits of that address, and I'm going to make that be where it goes to in cache. So this long mess of an address only can go to this one place in cache. Now, again, that makes it cheap to build a chip, okay? but there's a trade-off. Suppose I have two arrays, and these arrays have a size that is a multiple of the size of cache. Like on most chips today, the level one data cache is something like 32 kilobytes, right? So suppose I have an array whose length is 128 kilobytes. Can that happen? In fact, is that surprisingly common? That, that actually happens more often than you think. Well, here's the problem with that. If I've got, if I'm doing across a bunch of arrays, I'm doing some calculation that involves this array of that kind of length and that array of that kind of length, then every time I draw those 64 bytes of that cache line in the cache to look at, for example, A, I'll have a, a, a piece of code that shows this. Every time I draw that in, then I immediately clobber it with the cache line for the other array. And then when I draw that, when I need to go to the next one, I'm going to clobber that one. I'm going to clobber that one. So I never get any reuse out of the stuff that I've drawn into cache. I don't get any value. I spent all this time drawing 64 bytes into cache, and I only got to use four of those bytes, and then that got clobbered by a different 64 byte. And then that got clobbered, and over and over. We'll see a picture of that in a moment. Okay. Oh, very in a moment. By the way, how many of you are Fortran people? Wow! And how many of you are C or C++ or Java? Okay, so you're going to lose. It's okay. Because um, most of my examples, I have both Fortran and C. So here's the Fortran version. And for those of you following at home, if you look at the very next slide, you can see that it's the same thing in C. But we'll look at the Fortran version. So here I'm declaring three arrays, A, B, and C, of length some multiple of cache size, right? So it's 64 gig or, or sorry, K or 128K or something like that, right? Heck, it could be 192K. That's still a multiple of cache size. 
right? Okay. So that means that for any given index into my array, um, B of that index and C of that index map to the same location in time. And in fact, that's true of A as well. So if index is 12, a of 12 maps to a particular location in cache. B of 12 maps to the same location in cache. And C of 12 maps to the same location in cache. Well, how do I do this particular operation for index 12? Okay, so this means go find me B of 12. Go find me C of 12, right? And in each case, bring it into a register. Add those two registers together and put the result into A of 12. And I should add in that in order to write into a location in memory, you have to read that location of memory into cache, change it in cache, and then write it back out to memory. Don't ask why. Okay. So when I load B, when I load B of 12 into that um, register, that draws those 64 bytes that B of 12 is part of. That draws those 64 bytes immediately into that place in cache. But what happens when I draw in C of 12 to put it in a different register? Where does it go in cache? It goes to the exact same place. So what happens to the 64 bytes of B, around B of 12 that I just drew in? They get overwritten, they get clobbered, right? So when I go on to B of 13, when I go on to index 13, will B of 13 still be in cache? Or will it be wiped out? It'll actually not just have been wiped out by C, but then C of 12 will have been wiped out by A of 12. Because remember I said to write something out to memory, I've got to bring it into cache and then send it back out. I don't know why. That was a weird one, but it's true. Okay. So bring this in, clobber it with this, clobber it with this, then clobber that with this, and then clobber that with this. Each iteration, we're going to go through this again and again and again and again. It will literally take us, so this is double precision, so eight bytes per value. So there are, there are eight of those in a line of 64 bytes in a cache line. It will literally take eight times as long to do this loop under a direct map cache. Is that good or bad? It's terrible. Yes, thank you for the thumbs down. That was good. Okay, that's terrible. Okay, there's the C version again. Okay. Now, the opposite of direct map cache is fully associative cache. So fully associative cache means any cache at any place in RAM can go to any cache line. Now that has a wonderful advantage to it. The wonderful advantage of the fully associative cache is that you don't have to worry about this clobbering problem. This, this is called, by the way, cache thrashing. Cache thrashing, where you're constantly clobbering yourself. You don't have to worry about that under fully associative cache at all. Because anywhere in, in RAM can go to anywhere in cache. That sounds great, doesn't it? Now here's the flip side. It's terribly expensive. Okay, it's not literally implemented this way, but we can think of it as the moral equivalent of there has to be a wire from everywhere in RAM to everywhere in cache. So if you've got 12 gigabytes of RAM and what did we have? Three megabytes of cache, then you've got 36, hang on, quadrillion different wires that you have to put in your CPU. Again, it's not literally implemented that way, but it has the same sort of horrific cost implications. Okay, so if we look at the picture, right, anywhere in RAM can go to anywhere in cache. That's a lot more expense than what we had under direct map, where anywhere in RAM can only go to one place. Each place in RAM can only go to one place in cache, okay? So it's much, much, much more expensive to do fully associated. Therefore, nobody ever does it if it has ever happened in history, I'm not aware of it. Now, I haven't made a big study of these things, so maybe sometime in the distant past, somebody actually made a chip that had fully associated cache. I've never heard of it. Okay. 
Now, eventually, of course, you're going to run out of places in cash to put this up. So you need a strategy for under what circumstances will I kick out a particular line of cash and replace it with whatever it is I'm trying to draw in. And there are a lot of different strategies that are used. This is not by any means an exhaustive list of them, but probably the most common is some variation on what's called least recently used. So the thing that I haven't used in quite a while, so a particular value that's in cash, or a particular cash line, I haven't used it in a while, well, I assume then that I'm probably not gonna need it anytime soon. So it's the safest thing to kick out and replace with something else, okay? Because again, my RAM is much, much, much bigger than my cash. On this laptop, it's 3,000 times bigger. Sorry, 4,000 times bigger. So least recently used is a fairly common one, but there are others. You could do it random. Um, it turns out random is not necessarily that much worse than some of these other strategies. You can do first in, first out, whatever was brought in a long time ago, whether I've looked at it recently or not, whatever was brought in the longest ago, that's what I'm gonna replace. Um, you can do re least recently modified. If I've looked at it a lot, but I haven't changed it, then maybe I don't care about it. Round robin, just go from this one to this one to this one, and whichever one you happen to be on, that's what you'll kick out. Which in practice is maybe not that different operationally from random. But, so there's a lot of these strategies, and there are way more sophisticated, complicated things than this. But this sort of gives you the flavor of different ways that we could decide who do we clobber, right? Okay. Now here's the one, the cash mapping strategy, that is far and away the most popular. Um, and as far as I know today, is maybe the only one that's being used at all. Again, I'm not aware of a current chip that used direct map, and I've never heard of a chip that used fully associated. So set associates means there is a small number of different places in cash that any place in RAM could go. So here's a picture of that. So this would be a two-way set associative cash. So this location in RAM can go into two different locations in cash. Now, it's usually not two anymore. Um, I think, and I've got a slide here somewhere, I think. Yeah, here we go. So Sandy Bridge, which is a couple of generations uh, ago on the x86 and Intel AMD chips, Sandy Bridge, um, eight-way set associative. I think eight-way is what the Skylight chips are, although I won't swear to that. Um, the power chips, you can see four and two and so on, but set associative um, cache is far and away the most popular. So the advantage of this is it's the best balance of flexibility, like you have with fully associative, and low cost, which is what you have with direct map. So it's not much more expensive than direct map, but it's not much less um, efficient than fully associative. It turns out that fully associative is only slightly better than, let's call it N way set associative, where I'm not going to say what N is, but probably it's in the neighborhood of eight. Um, and again, this is worth noticing, where did I put it? Um, you, you, again, for set associate cash, you're still going to have some strategy for deciding which of the, let's say, eight different places you could put a cash line, which of them you're going to put. So, and, and the strategies um, come from sort of the same um, set of ideas. Okay. So I'm on slide 59. All right, so if it is in cash, then it's still in RAM. But if it is in RAM, it's not necessarily in cash. Why is that? Why is everything that's in cash is in RAM, but not everything that's in RAM is in cash? How big is my RAM on my laptop? Anybody remember? How big is your RAM on your laptop? You haven't checked? Okay. Usually it's several gigabytes, okay? And how big is my cash? megabytes. So there's a difference of like a factor of a thousand. My RAM is much bigger. So there's no possible way that all of my RAM could fit in my cache, right? Only a teeny tiny, well under 1% of my RAM actually can squeeze into my cache. But just because it's in cache doesn't mean we took it out of RAM. It's still in RAM. Okay? 
very important um, because what happens if you change a value that's in cash? So it turns out there's two ways that you can deal with that. One of them is if you change it in cash, you immediately change it in RAM. Okay? So I'm going to change it in RAM um, as soon as, so yes, I'll change it in cash, but then immediately off it goes to RAM. Is that slow or fast? Remembering that transitioning data between RAM and cache is super slow, then if I do it every single time, that'd be super slow, especially, suppose I'm calculating um, some sum, a, a sum, right? So then changing that value in cache, and I'm changing it over and over and over as I'm calculating the sum of some array, right? So the array has a bunch of elements, and I start with the uh, value for the sum is zero, and then I add the value of the first element, and now the value for the sum is five, and then I go to the next element of the array, and now my value is 12, and then it's 82, and so on, and I'm constantly changing that value in cash over and over and over. Okay. If that immediately gets pushed out to RAM, then that sum is going to be super duper slow. But, if instead I say, I will wait, and I will not update the RAM until, and I'll get to what until will be, but I will not update the RAM until, and then when I update the RAM, then I will pay the time cost of moving data between cache and RAM. But I'll only do that, let's say, once, not over and over and over. That'll make the thing run much faster. So we have names for that. Right through means every time I change the value of cash, I will immediately change the value of RAM. That has the obvious disadvantage that it's slow compared to the opposite, which is right back. I will not change the value in RAM until I'm clobbering that cash line with something else. Okay. And the way I'll do that is if I change the value in cash, then I will have a little special bit, just a single bit, called the dirty bit. And if I change the value in cash, I will mark that value in cash as dirty. And when I go to clobber the cash line that that dirty value is in, dirty just means it got changed. Then I, before I clobber that value, I will copy it out to RAM. So that's much, much faster. So write back is much, much faster than write through. So is write back good or bad? How many of you vote it's good? How many of you vote it's bad? How many of you vote maybe there's a hidden problem? So yes, good. I'm glad you anticipated the engineering issue. There is a hidden problem. It's called cache coherency. So the difficulty is, and the good news is that the clever engineers who design chips have solved this problem. The difficulty is that if the value has been changed in cache but not yet in RAM, then if another core goes and looks up what value lives at that address in RAM, the RAM will have the wrong value because it's got the old value instead of the new value. So the designers of chips have worked very hard to come up with mechanisms to ensure that if a value is dirty in cache, then any other core that goes to look for it will find out that it's dirty and figure out where to go look for the correct one. That does slow things down, but it's still cheaper than right through. So pretty much all chips today use the right back strategy instead of the right through strategy because it's so much quicker but they have some cache coherency strategy to make sure that an innocent other core that innocently stumbles across that location in RAM does not get the old value instead of the new value, does get the correct value. One way or another, that will get handled properly. By the way, this is not like a fake problem that doesn't matter in real life. We actually dealt with this one time, not on the cache in RAM, but on a disk system. So we had a disk system, and on that disk system, it had a hidden helpful feature. And the hidden helpful feature was this. There was a special little battery 
inside the disk system. And if something went wrong with that battery, then to be safe, it would switch from copying everything from RAM, sorry, hanging on to everything in RAM until it could get around to copy it to disk, to instead immediately sending everything to disk, not letting it sit in RAM for any time, length of time. Because the death of that battery meant that the stuff that was in RAM might not make it to disk. And one day the battery ran out. And the system did not alert us that the battery had run out. It instead decided, hmm, it's unsafe to use write back between my RAM and my disk. So I'm going to switch it to write through without telling anybody. Well, of course, that made the disk system run super duper slow. So all of a sudden, we were getting hate mail from lots of our users. Why is your disk so super duper slow? And the answer was because it had invisibly switched from write back into and we had not noticed the buried place in the documentation that said, guess what will happen if the battery runs out? So now we know. Right? And it's good that it does that. But we didn't realize it at the time. OK. So um, I did find um, one example going way, way back to mid-2000s, I think, where there was one level of cache that did do right through. Um, by default, but that's the only one I've ever been able to find. Mostly because a lot of this information is not even published anywhere that you can find, because it's not the sort of stuff that most people would be interested in, and anyway, you don't have any control over it. Okay, now, does anybody recognize this flavor of chip? What? Yeah, it's actually a map of the OU campus, so right. but it looks like a chip, doesn't it? So I've got 4,000 times as much RAM as I have cash on my laptop. Is that good or bad? How many of you vote that's good? How many of you vote that's bad? How many of you vote some of both? Okay. So the bad part is I can't guarantee that my data will be in cash when I need them because there's not nearly enough room, right? I've only got, let's see. So on average, the probability that the data I need are in cash when I need them is one in 4,000, right? Because I got 12 gigabytes of RAM, three megabytes of cache. Okay. So that's, that seems bad. On the other hand, what if I built my laptop out of 12 gigabytes of cache? What would my laptop cost? Remember how much cache cost per megabyte? It was $20, $20 per megabyte. So if I build a three, sorry, a 12 gigabyte laptop, at $20 per megabyte, so that's $20,000 per gigabyte, times 12, that'd be $240,000, a quarter million dollars would be on a laptop. Um, and I, I got my laptop reasonably cheap, so in rough figures, that's uh, a factor of, uh, what is that, 5,000 more than I actually paid for my laptop, right? So if I didn't mind paying a quarter million dollars for a laptop, cash would be a great deal. But I do mind. Okay, well, um, I mind, my wife minds, my boss would mind. Nobody's going to let me pay a quarter million dollars for a laptop. So to keep my laptop price reasonable, I use RAM instead of cash, right? Okay. So then if I've got such tiny cash, what possible value does my cash have? Okay. Anybody here ever bought a house? You know, horse head. You've done it. You've done it. Okay. What are the three most important things in the world of real estate? Say it loud. Location, location, location. Location, location, location. Now, I, I may have mentioned computer scientists have this problem where we're pathologically unable to leave a word alone. So if you give us a word, we have to do one of the following things to it, or perhaps more than one. Uh, we have to change um, its um, spelling. So we don't say B-I-T-E, we say B-Y-T-E, like. Um, we could change its part of speech, right? So we don't say arithmetic, we say arithmetic, because that's the adjective. Or we could change um, the part of speech by putting on some new suffix or prefix. Okay? So in the world of computing, we don't say location. We say locality. Which, by the way, in real life, what does the word locality mean? 
Yes, it means where something is, a location, correct, right? Locality is sort of another word for tab, right? Or part of tab, right? Oh no, computer scientists won't permit that. No, no, to us, locality is an adjective in the same way that um, small is an adjective. So it means how local something is. That is, how close to something else something is. So in the computing world, we say locality, and what we mean is how local it is. Okay? And in particular, we have two kinds of locality. There's temporal locality, which means if I've been here recently, then I will probably come back to here soon. And then there's spatial locality. If I've been here recently, then probably I will go to nearby places soon. Okay. And it turns out that although there's nothing that ought to force locality, spatial and temporal locality, to be true in real life, it turns out that in real life this is actually true. This is how programs typically work. If I have been here recently, I'll come back here soon. If I have been here recently, I'll be nearby soon. These are really what happens. Now, I've carefully not defined the words nearby or soon, and that's on purpose. They are poorly defined, but this is still true. Okay. And cache is designed to take advantage of this. So um, here's the C version. Do I have a Fortran version? Oh, yes, good. Okay. So here's the Fortran version, because we are more Fortran folks here in the room. Okay. So I'm passing some array and its length into some routine, and that routine um, is going to fill it up with some values. These values are junk, right? This is not an interesting routine. This is just to show you how this works. Okay. So I'm going to march from one end of this array to the other and fill in the values in that array. This is really typical of how real life works. Very often, what we're doing, if we have some big array, what we're doing is we're just marching from one end of the array to the other and doing the same kind of operation over and over at every location, or at least most locations, or large subset of locations within that array. This is very typical behavior. Why is this typical behavior? Because it's easy to write. Just about every programming language makes it easy to express marks from one end of this array to the other. Now, interesting, because um, every programming language makes it easy to do this, then therefore there's lots of code in the real world that does this. But because there's lots of real world code that does this, then the people who make computer hardware design their computer hardware to be fast at this. But because they design their computer hardware to be fast at this, and you know that's true because um, when you're going to decide what computer hardware to buy, if you've got millions of dollars on the line on this decision, you need to be smart about the decision. So you'll test, you'll take the codes that you're most likely to run with a typical input, and you'll test on the different kinds of hardware and see which one is fastest or even better, which one has the best ratio of cost to speed? I want the most speed per dollar is what I want, right? I don't want the most speed because I can't afford the most speed. I want the most speed per dollar, right? Because that'll get me the best bang for my buck. Well, if that's how we're deciding how to buy the next piece of hardware, then of course the hardware manufacturers will therefore design the hardware around doing this sort of thing fast. But if they design the hardware around doing this sort of thing fast, then how will we write our code? We'll write our code this way. Because after all, the hardware we have, it does this fast. Okay. Let's compare this to a completely different way of filling up an array. So I'm going to pass in another array, which is filled with all of the indices of this array. So this array, let's say array length is 100. In real life, it would probably be a million or a billion, but let's say it's 100. Okay. This array will have all of the numbers from 1 to 100 in it, but in random order. Okay. So what that means is instead of marching from one end of the array to the other, it'll randomly jump around. Okay. So which one of these will run faster? This one that marches from one end of the array to the other? Or this one 
that jumps around a lot. Which one is how um, we'll write our code in real life? The first one, why? By the way, I totally agree. It's important. Yes, but so what? Now it turns out that is true, absolutely. But there's an even simpler reason why we write our code the simple way and not the complicated way. Because the complicated way is more complicated to write. Who needs it, right? That's a lot of trouble to go to. Why bother when we can just write it the simple way? But then you're absolutely correct. The hardware is designed to run this simple way much faster. And I didn't just say that, I brought data with me. Okay. So here is a graph showing the two of them, depending on how big the array is. And by the way, this is logarithmic in the horizontal. So when it says zero, it doesn't mean an array of like zero, it means an array of like two to the zero. Um, so this is an array of length one, and up here is an array of length a billion. So um, two to the 30th is a billion. So different array lengths. And you can see, so the pink one down here, this is doing them in order, right? Marching from one to the other. And this darker one, the dark blue one, is doing them in the random order. And here, this is the amount of time it takes to fill that array. And you can, so lower is better, because time is money. You want to reduce the time. You can see the ordered approach is vastly cheaper, especially when the array is really big. Vastly cheaper. Because when we draw in a particular location in memory, here, back. When we draw in a particular index, so if I'm on index 12 here, then index 13 is probably already drawn into cache with index 12 because it's part of that same 64 byte cache line or 128 byte or whatever. Right? It's part of the same cache line. Yes? How am I doing on time? Oh, I'm doing really poorly on time. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll get to the most important example. So, how many of you have done matrix stuff? Okay, have you ever by hand multiplied two matrices? How many have done that? You did it in like a linear algebra class, took like two three by three matrices and multiplied them out by hand? Okay, so the rule is very simple for how you multiply them out. So if I'm going to do A is assigned B times C, right? Matrix, matrix, multiply. Then what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and shout from here, okay? So I'm going to go horizontally in the Bs and vertically in the C, so I'll multiply B11 by C11, then I'll multiply B12 by C21, then B13 by C31, and so on. And as I'm going along, I'm adding those little tiny products together. So it becomes B11 times C11 plus B12 times C21 plus B13 times C31, and so on. Okay? And I do that for every element of A. Okay? So, um, so here's, down here I, I expressed it in summation notation, and this is just for an individual element of the product array. I have to do this entire thing, right? So far so good? Okay. So here's the Fortran version. I have also the C version. For every location in the product array, what I was calling A, for every location in the product array, I set that value to zero. And then I loop over the across on A, on B, and the down on C, and I multiply, and then I add those together, right? Okay. That's what this expression is. So, Professor Good? That's the brute force way. That's the obvious way to do this work. Addition and multiplication, what mathematical property do they have that makes us love them? Anybody remember? It started with a C. They are commutative. What does that mean? Anyone remember? Addition is commutative. Remember what that means? It means A plus B is the same as B plus A. Multiplication is also commutative. A times B is the same as B times A, right? So five times four is the same as four times five, both times, okay? So can I change the order in which I do these calculations? Does the order matter? as long as I get the right set of them. Why does the order matter? 
but it's addition and multiplication. So it turns out that because it's just made up of these little individual additions and multiplications, they are individually commutative. Commutative, ooh, that's hard to say. Okay. So what I could do, for example, is I, instead of going Q from one to NQ, I could go from NQ down to one, for example. I could reverse the order. It wouldn't change the outcome, right? Because I'd still add up the same partial products. I could switch source one and source two. It wouldn't, add, it wouldn't change the outcome. Well, if I could do it backwards instead of forwards, could I do it from the middle out? Could I do it in random order? So it doesn't matter what the order is. Well, if it doesn't matter what the order is, could I change the order in a way that gets me more um, reuse of the cache? There's the C version for those of you who are playing along. By the way, it turns out Fortran actually comes with a routine to do matrix multiply, but we're not going to get into the details of that. Okay. So here's what I just described, the brute force way of doing it. And here is the routine that's built in to Fortran. So how could that be so much faster? The answer is they're doing things in a clever order. All right, so tiling. So a tile, yes, question from TV land. Five minutes, okay. Uh, I might go a little over. So a tile is a little chunk of memory, a chunk of an array. It's not the whole thing. It's a rectangular subset of it. Tiling simply means breaking a bigger thing into smaller things, tiles, okay? So how many of you have used like Google Earth or something like that? Okay. So have you noticed that when you pull down a particular place on the map, it comes in little squares, right? And then when you zoom in, for example, you get a new set of little squares. So what they've done is they've tiled the Earth. So if you ask, give me a, this piece of the Earth, not all of the Earth, just give me this little piece. The way that they've stored it is they've stored it in little chunks, so just look up which chunks correspond to that place on the map, and then they assemble those chunks together. So that's similar to what we're talking about here. It's again, a form of tiling. Okay. So the strategy we're gonna use here is, I'm gonna take a tile of B and a tile of C, and I'm gonna just work on those tiles and not the whole all the way across the row, all the way, the way across the column. Just little rectangular areas on B and C, okay? All right, so here's the outer part of this. Again, because we're Fortran programmers in the room, we'll look at the Fortran version with the C versions in the slides, okay? So from one to the number of columns, but instead of going up by one at a time, marching one at a time, I'm gonna go up by a chunk at a time. Likewise with the rows. Likewise with that thing in the middle where I'm going across on one and down on the other, right? I'm gonna go a chunk at a time, okay? And by the way, the amount of the size of each chunk in the different directions can differ. It doesn't have to all be the same. But then for each one of them that I'm doing, I'm gonna call this other routine that's gonna do just the work of that little chunk, okay? And that other routine is almost identical. Oh, that's the, sorry. That's the C version. Okay. So here is where the magic happened. I took the original version and I really just added one little thing, which is I'll only set the location in A, the, the, the particular value in A, I'll only set it if I'm starting at one, if I'm starting at the beginning. Otherwise, I'll keep adding two. So here, this looks exactly like what we had before, except instead of saying one to NQ, I'm just saying Q start to QN. Instead of saying one to NR, number of rows, I'm saying first row to last row, first column to last column, okay? So the advantage of that is now I'm working on these little subsets, okay? Why is that good? Now remember, when I draw something from RAM into cache, I pay a big time cost for doing that. 
then if I stay in my little tiles, I can keep working on the same stuff that I already drew in hand. So I'm going to squeeze more juice out of every bite that I drew into cash. Because I was going to visit the same places over and over and over. I'm going to visit the same places over and over and over. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's just visit it over and over and over. Now, by the way, this is not perfect. I'm not going to completely eliminate the memory loss. But I'll immensely reduce the memory loss. And by memory loss, I mean the time for moving the data between RAM and cache. Okay. Same thing in C. All right, I want to prove I'm not lying. Don't you love it when I prove I'm not lying? So I actually tested this. Okay. okay, and by the way, in the vertical, this is seconds. Okay. In the horizontal, it's how big. And in particular, how big is the tile? And way over here, this is, I didn't bother doing tiling at all. I set the tile size equal to the size of the table. Okay. So I'm not tiling at all over here. Over here, my tile is tiny. Itty, 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 tiny tile. And what's interesting, and I, I did this both with um, time cost expressed linearly on the left-hand side and time cost in the logarithmic on the right-hand side. In the logarithmic, you can see that regardless of how big the arrays are, no matter how big the arrays are, the behavior is the same. Over here, you can see what the behavior actually is. So it turns out that right in this little narrow window here, I get the best possible performance. That is, the time it takes to multiply these matrices is reduced to the minimum, as low as it's going to go. Okay. But what does this correspond to? Well, it's somewhere between 10,000 and 100,000. What do we remember is somewhere, and it's, by the way, closer to the 10,000 side than the 100,000. What do we remember is close to the 10,000 side, smaller than 100,000? L1 cache. Well, specifically L1 data cache, right? That's right around 32K, is where it has, before it starts slowing in either direction. So if I can fit all of the tiles into level one, then I get the best possible performance. And look at this, this is what? This is 60 seconds, more or less? Right? Whereas up here, when I wasn't tiling at all, it's two and a half times as long. So far, so good. But wait, then why is it that when the tiles are really small, the time cost is worse than not tiling at all? Why would that be? Let's go back and look at the code. Code is always the clue. So all of this stuff is just there to get us the tile. Where's the beginning and the end along each of our dimensions? And then we call this routine. When there is no tiling, when the size of a tile is the size of the whole matrix, then how many times do we call this routine? Just one. So is the time cost of calling the routine high or low? I'm going to call it one time. Look, what if the size of the tile is one element? Then how many times will we call it? Many, many times, right? So let's call it n cubed if our matrix was n by n, right? So then would the total overhead of calling that routine be high or low? High, because we're calling it over and over and over and over, right? Like if n were a thousand, and the tile size were one element, we'd be calling that routine a billion times. So what happens in this performance curve is that when we call that routine too many times, then the cost of calling the routine starts to exceed the cost of doing the calculation. So this is the sweet spot when the size of the tile fits, just barely fits into level one cache, but we're not making the tile so small that we're calling the routine too. Isn't that amazing? Now, this raises a question. Does tiling, uh, okay, and so here's the advantage of the tiling, right? 
So um, number one, it does a beautiful job of exploiting data locality. Okay? You get to reuse what's in cache already over and over and over instead of using it just once. So your cost of moving data in and out of cache goes way down. So your cost to do the work goes way down. You saw it didn't take a lot of extra coding. It took a little bit, but not that much. Okay. And a little bit of extra coding to get a big speed up. We saw it was a factor of two and a half improvement in runtime. That's totally worth it. If you are on a machine where you don't need the tiling, it's trivial to turn off the tiling that you wrote the code for, because all you have to do is set the size of the tile equal to the size of the matrix. Really trivial. Okay. So will that work with every application? So it turns out the answer is no, and it's very specific. If you have lots and lots of calculations per byte of data, and you can figure out an order to do things where you can take advantage of that fact, then tiling can be a huge win for you. But if you don't have a lot of calculations per byte of data, then tiling is not going to help very much. We're going to get into the details of that in a few weeks, about what it means to have a lot of calculations per byte of data. But roughly speaking, what you want is that the number of calculations be a function of the number of data, not a constant times the number of data. You want there to be um, zillions of calculations per byte, not a few. And by the way, a few here might be defined as tens of thousands. And I'm out of time, so we're not going to have time to do this. And I, most semesters, when we do this, I don't have time to get to this. So when you come back next week, we're going to start parallelism. Are you excited? Yeah. Yes. Parallelism is awesome. Thanks, folks. And we'll see you next week.